Um, you know that today's talk will be given by the most interesting person in the world, Scott Morrison. Um, Scott did his PhD uh, in Berkeley in 2007 with Vaughan Jones, and then he worked um, at Postdoc at Microsoft in Santa Barbara, and also worked uh, at Berkeley for a while. Um, then he moved to ANU, he was a senior lecturer and a DEFRA fellow. At the moment, he's a future fellow and associate professor there. And in 2015, <coughs> Scott won both the Heidel Medal and the Austin Semester. And his talk today is about interactive theorem. Thanks very much. Yeah, so this is going to be uh, a bit of an interesting talk. I don't know how it's going to go. I've never tried to uh, really stand in front of an audience of mathematicians and talk about this stuff. Um, it's been a bit of a hobby of mine for the last two years, a hobby that's gradually taking over my, uh, my mathematical life, maybe. Uh, the, uh, I mean, by, by training, uh, as Peter was saying, I mean, I, I came from, from category theory and operator algebras and low-dimensional topology and all these other aspects of, of, uh, of, of pure maths, where I've always used computers in various ways in my research. Um, and uh, I think this whole field of interactive theorem proving is a, is a very interesting one because it's mostly been disconnected from the world of mathematicians. It's something that computer scientists have created and owned for the most part. Uh, and I, I hope that's going to change. And I hope more and more mathematicians are going to see the relevance of this stuff and start using it. Uh, and so part of this talk is really proselytizing. It's trying to explain to mathematicians why this is something that we're going to have to start thinking about or maybe that we want to start thinking about uh, in the future. Okay, so the basic structure of the talk is the following. Why on earth should we do this? Why should we care? Um, why, why is it relevant uh, to mathematicians? Uh, a bit on, on what it is from a, a, maybe a, a slightly theoretical point of view. Um, we're actually going to hopefully prove something. We'll do a little demo. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll convince the computer of something. And I'll show you a little bit about how to use some of these systems. And then uh, maybe if there's time, I'm not sure, we can, uh, we can speculate a little bit about, about what the future looks like for interactive theorem proving and, uh, and mathematics. Uh, I have no particular attachment to getting to the end of my talk or the planned end of my talk. If you guys want to interrogate me and shout me down and complain about things and ask questions, that's great. So please, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, okay, so any questions already? Okay, okay. So why, why do interactive theorem proving, whatever, whatever that is? Well, I mean, obviously computers help us in lots of ways as mathematicians already. Um, for one, most of us uh, use, use tech to types in our mathematics. Uh, but uh, I think also most of us in some way use computer algebra systems or uh, sometimes write our own code that does calculations or does searches or does simulations. Uh, and we're, we're already extremely familiar with the idea that computers make us more powerful as mathematicians. Uh, the interactive theorem proving uh, is, the, is this idea that uh, we, can, we can sit down and have a conversation with a computer, at the end of which hopefully the computer agrees it believes the theorem that we're trying to say. Uh, but as well as it just saying, no, I don't believe that step, uh, an important part of interactive theorem proving is that it speaks back to us, and it, it has ideas, and has contributions, and it fills in little easy steps. Or, tells you that some branch of an idea doesn't work, so on. And I think that uh, although it's early days yet, there's a huge amount of scope for us being better at proving things by having, by having computers as part of the conversation. OK. And another uh, reason that I think is maybe slightly more immediate is that uh, formalization uh, makes it, in some ways, easier to verify things, or at least certainly easier to be sure that things have been verified. Uh, and I think. People can disagree about this in different areas of mathematics, but I think everyone agrees there are some problems with the truthiness of mathematics as it gets as it as it gets produced. There are certainly I know lots of papers that I've written and that other people have written that have mistakes in them that get fixed much further down the line, if at all. And interactive theorem proving or automated theorem proving is something that, that can address this issue and help us uh, help us become more confident. Okay. Uh, Formalization, I want to emphasize that uh, when, you, when you formalize mathematics, you can do it in whatever logical system you feel like. In particular, uh, some people, historically, many people who do formal mathematics with the computer have worked in a 
in some other logic than, than working mathematicians working. They've, they've, they've not wanted to use the law of the excluded middle, or they've not wanted to use action of choices. And they can do that if they like, but that's by no means necessary. We can, we can be normal mathematicians who love the action of choice and do all this stuff. When you formalize things in that more restricted world where you're working constructively, then interactive theorem provers, I think, uh, form a, a really nice middle ground between uh, the, the activities of proving theorems and writing algorithms that compute stuff. I think a huge fraction of the time as mathematicians when we prove things, we actually are really describing algorithms that fail to ever be implemented or run because we only write the algorithms on pieces of paper and in text. And I think that uh, a nice side effect of more effort going into, into writing proofs in the computer will be that we'll get computations for free as a result. All of these interactive theorem proofers, if you happen to write a proof that's constructed, it outputs a program that, that can be run. Okay. So, uh, well, another reason why you maybe should pay attention and be interested today is there's some chance that it, whether you care or not, uh, it's going to be important in the future. Uh, and so it might, you, know, you might need to know about this stuff to, to keep up. I'm not sure how true that, that is. One thing I'll, I really want to say, though, about why to care about this stuff is students seem to love it. Uh, I've had a, a, a stream now of students working in semester time and over the summer and so on, on this sort of stuff. Uh, and I've sort of been amazed uh, both how far they get in, in doing stuff in this way and how much they like, how much they enjoy the process. They sit at the end of it. I had a most amazing conversation with a student in which they said at some point, I wanted to understand X, some, some subject of mathematics, and to make sure I really understood it, I started formalizing it. And to me, that was a, just an alien thought that I'd never had when growing up, but, but, uh, but it's, it's interesting to see that, that it happens now. Okay. Um, oh, that's, that's a little propaganda. Great. Um, the, maybe I should have put this in a slightly different order. What is interactive theorem proving? Okay. <laughs> so, actually, just how many people in the room are, are students here at the moment? Like, there must be, there, there's lots, more than half of the room. Okay, great. So this is a talk that is actually addressed to all you guys, because I know that it's sort of provocative to say we're going to start doing mathematics in interactive theorem proofs in the future. And all the grown-ups in the room are too set in their ways. They're never going to do this. Once they all die, however, the students can take it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sure, yeah. <they're, laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, um, okay. So what, what is interactive theorem proving? So in some sense, an interactive theorem prover is just a programming language. Uh, but it's a programming language which has certain characteristics. Um, they're typically very high-level programming languages, sort of in the sense that, I don't know, um, Mathematica or Scala or, or even Python or even or Python are relatively high and C and Assembler and so on are very very low level ones, and they usually have uh, extremely strong type systems, which we'll get onto in, in just a second. Uh, but the idea is just that somehow they're extremely expressive languages in which you can talk about mathematics. Uh, we'll we'll get on in a second to what it exactly it means to uh, to write a program. Uh, well, what the difference between writing programs and writing proofs is, but uh, not much of a difference. And associated with that, that programming language, there's a whole bunch of machinery, some software, that lets you talk about and manipulate goals and hypotheses and axioms and theorems and dependencies between these things and, and so on. And finally, a very important part of interactive theorem proving uh, is what's usually called automation. Uh, which is essentially which are essentially just programs that that write proofs. They are um, programs which can inspect a current collection of goals and hypotheses, and with <coughs> some amount of human oversight, either none or or, or lots, uh, move along the proof in, in various ways. And that automation is sort of an integral part of of the, of the of, well, you have the language and this tooling and this automation, and they they all need to be there together in order to be able to. Get any mathematics done? Uh, I guess people. I guess a word to know, in case I use it later. Uh, the the common phrase is here is also tactics. A, a tactic in this in this in this world is just a program that helps write a proof, either a whole proof or or, or some some component of a proof. 
Okay, uh, so there are many different programming languages uh, which uh, count as interactive theorem provers, and uh, I'll just name maybe the, the three biggest examples: uh, Miser, Isabel, and Koch, uh, which are which are very very different languages and and approach doing mathematics uh, very differently. Um, there's a there's actually a very very nice article if you if you're interested in this. Um, I forget the title. I'll make sure there's a link in my notes later. But uh, uh, it's something like the history of interactive theorem proving, something like that, which, which goes through these and, and is, explains the philosophical differences. But today, I'm going to try and tell you uh, about this language Lean, which, which is the one that I've mostly been working in. And the reason it's the one I've been working in is, is that all of these, Lean included, are no good. They're, they're, they're not ready for a large number of mathematicians to come along and start trying to work in them. It's still too painful to get mathematics done. But Lean is the latest and greatest of these, and it's the closest approximation to something that mathematicians will, will care about using. Uh, and so even though I'm going to say every, everything I say will be, well, a lot of what I say will be specifically about Lean, I don't want to, I don't want to come across as particularly attached to this language. If a new thing comes along that's going to be easier for mathematicians to use, fine, we'll chuck out Lean, and, and we'll go there. OK. Uh, one aspect of it being the latest and greatest, and just a warning here, is that it keeps changing, and you can wake up in the morning and your program <coughs> doesn't compile anymore because there's a new version of Lean Out. The, the people developing it are committed to making it better, not to, to, to promising you that it keeps working today. Um, okay, uh, it's all open source. The core developers are mostly at Microsoft Research. Uh, there's a very active community of both computer scientists and mathematicians go online and find chat rooms full of people who will help solve your problems for you, uh, and so on. Uh, OK, so now we get to the two main points I want to make here about Lean. So the first one, which we'll spend a couple of slides on in a moment, is that it's based on what is known as dependent type theory. So this is addressing uh, sort of what the logical foundations of the mathematics that we're doing when we do mathematics in Lean is. So dependent type theory here is intended, uh, hopefully, or Maybe most people have heard of ZFC and know that officially that's what we all do, uh, in the sense that that's one of the, um, the the standard ways of setting up a logical foundation for mathematics. Dependent type theory is just an alternative. You could you could imagine that everything you do is based in the end on dependent type theory rather than ZFC, and Lean, uh, along with Koch, uh, work in work in that world. We'll we'll, we'll spend a little while on this. Uh, now. This last point won't make much sense uh, for a little while, uh, but Lean is its own meta-language. Now, that could mean a few different things, but the practical upshot is that, as I said on the previous slide, automation or tactics are extremely important. You want the computer to help you write, write the proofs, and it quickly becomes inevitable that you're going to want to write your own automation as you develop mathematics in one of these things. You're going to want to write new tactics that will help you as you go, as you realize uh, things that need to be automated. In these languages, especially these ones, doing that is hard. You basically need to be a developer of the language to add new automation to the system, add new tactics to the system. Talk it's a little bit easier. And Lean, it's, well, I want to say easy, but it's not. It's just way less bad than the, than the other three. So there's the prospect, of, at least, of mathematicians, rather than the system developers here, actually introducing new automation in the into the systems, new, new, new programs that help write groups. OK. Questions? Complaints? OK. Um, OK. So dependent type theory. Uh, the really, really short version of dependent type theory is that uh, you should stop writing uh, x is a natural number, or x is a point of some manifold m, and you should just start writing x colon natural number, and you're done. You're now using dependent type theory rather than, rather than set theory. Um, OK, uh, here's the slightly longer version of that. So everything that we talk about in dependent type theory uh, is either a term or a type. So this is just like the idea that in ZFC, everything is a set. Okay? But now there are two fundamental notions which we, we call terms and types. Uh, so here are some examples of terms. The, the, the number three, uh, this is meant to be a list of strings. Uh, each, each element of the list is itself a, uh, either a character or a string or something. Uh, 
uh, S7, the, the manifold, or the natural numbers. Okay, those are all examples of terms. They're just the, the objects that we're talking about in video mathematics. Now, every term has, throughout its entire lifetime, a fixed and unambiguous type. So here, three is a term of type of the natural numbers. This list here, A space L I S T, is a list of strings. S7 is a smooth manifold. And the natural numbers themselves are a type. Okay? So uh, the this is okay, so this is something different from, from ZFC, um, where everything is just a set, there aren't these two different levels. Uh, and maybe just one thing before I go on is that um, notice here the natural numbers appeared on, on both lines here. That uh, natural numbers, I said you could think of that as a term of type type. Uh, and this is then uh, type one there, you can also think of it as a term, it will be a term of type two. And there's this whole hierarchical universe of, of bigger and bigger types, which you uh, which is sort of the, the, the inevitable corresponding fact to, this, to the usual paradoxes in set theory about sets of all sets and so on. We, we, we deal with those sorts of issues by having this hierarchy of, of, uh, of, of universes and a type, the collection of all types in one universe is a term up in the next universe. Usually for most mathematics you, you can ignore all of that stuff and, and not worry about it. Okay, uh, a, a very important thing in, 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 a, in a, a dependent type theory is that there's, a, there's an effective procedure for type checking. That is, if I write down some formula and I tell you this has type x, this, where I told you, where I gave you some formula for a type x, the computer can decide effectively whether, whether that, that type judgment is true or not. Okay? Uh, personally, I don't care about these logical details at the bottom of the world, uh, but they're things I'm, I meant to say in saying what dependent type is. Okay. What I want to do. The, the point I want to make at the very bottom of the slide is explaining how proofs and, and doing mathematics come, comes into this. Essentially, we're just going to take any proposition, something that we might want to prove or disprove or something, and we're just going to say, well, it's one of these types. So is prime 57 is this type that, that represents uh, well, the, the primeness of, of 57. And the idea is just that what are the terms of this type well, they're just the proofs that 57 is prime. So hopefully, in a, in a usable system, we're actually going to be able to prove that this type is empty. There are no, ter no possible terms of, of this type, uh, unless you're very uh, And uh, indeed, but, but another thing to note is that uh, is prime 57 being a type might have many different terms. That is, you might have, well, maybe I should change 57 to 13 or something. But then there might be many different proofs that 13 is prime, and they're all considered as distinct terms of, of, of this type. You don't necessarily just say propositions are true or false. You might, you might want to keep track of which proof you're talking about. Okay. Once you have this idea that we're just going to have propositions be, be get more types, writing a proof is exactly the same thing as writing a function. Okay? Uh, the natural numbers uh, are a type, and if you want to give me the fifth Fibonacci number, you just write a little program that produces a term, and it's exactly the same sort of process. We just write, we just write a function that produces some term that the type checker agrees is a term of is prime 57. And that's what counts as a, counts as a proof. Um, you've, got a, you've got an unhappy look on your face. Do you, no, no, okay. <laughs> You're allowed to have an unhappy look. It's okay. It's a, it's a, um, <laughs> Okay, um, okay. So I didn't tell you in any of that where types come from. I just sort of asserted that all the natural numbers are a type, and this is a type, and that's a type. And so we need to we need to have some rules that let us introduce new new types. And uh, well, I'm going to I'm not going to actually specify the rules for constructing new types. I'm just going to show you the sorts of ways in which you can do it. So here is me defining a new, a new type. Uh, I'm, I'm using the syntax of lean here, but hopefully it's, it's all relatively readable. Def just means we're making a definition. 
for defining some gadget called vector. It takes an argument alpha of some type, so you might think of the natural numbers or smooth manifolds or something like that, and it takes a natural number, n, and the colon here is saying that this function here is returning a type, okay? So this is something that's constructing a new type. And then the colon equals, just means we're now giving a formula for this function, and now we can say that it is, so this, this uh, brace notation here, which uh, to normal mathematicians is a, uh, it's like a subset of a set with some predicate, is now, uh, is now a subtype. Uh, and so here what we're doing is we're saying, well, this type consists of lists L, of, of, of where the elements of the list are of type alpha, such that the, the length of L is n. That's a, that's a, that line is a, is a perfectly sensible thing, and I think it's, in fact, the definition of vector in Lean. Also, with those arguments the other way around, that kind of argument. Okay, but that then constructed for us uh, a type which very obviously corresponds to, to a, a vector of some fixed range. Something to notice here, uh, and that explains the name here, is that when I now write uh, vector, uh, Natural number three, okay. That whole gadget there is some is a type, but this is a dependent type in that it's not some some fixed type. It's a type with some parameters. For one, it depends on another type, uh, what the elements of these vectors are going to be, the natural numbers. But it also depends on a term, okay. This three here is just is just some natural number, and dependent type theory is basically just this idea that we're allowed to construct new types that depend on both other types and other terms of, of, of type. Uh, this is a sort of thing that you can't do in nearly all programming languages. Uh, for people who are used to working in, in typed languages, well, many languages are just not typed at all. Uh, maybe, well, uh, many, many languages have, have a fixed set of types, like in, in, in C you have, I don't know, int and long, R and whatever else, just some fixed God-given set of types. Maybe in later versions of C you can adjust that a bit. Uh, and then uh, over in, say, languages like, like Java, uh, you can write things like list string. And this is some type that depends on another type. But this part, having a type that depended on a term, is something that's not available in nearly all programming languages. So it's very hard to, to fake in the uh, most programming languages, and uh, it is essentially one of the big things in, in Kotlin and Lean that make it easy and familiar to, to do mathematics. Okay, uh, let's go on a little bit. Uh, you can define inductive types. Uh, I don't want to go into this too, too long, but the basic idea when you define an inductive type is you introduce a new type, and the way that you introduce it is you explain to us how you produce new terms of that type, and what you're allowed to do if you've got an element of that type. Let, let me write a, 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 an even simpler one first. Let me uh, define the natural numbers. So we would write inductive to say we're making a uh, we're making a new inductive type called the natural numbers. And the, the two ways you can construct a natural number are just uh, zero, okay, which gives a natural number, and successor which is a function that takes an actual number we had before and produces a new one, okay? So uh, if you didn't have natural numbers already in your type system, you can just make them just by writing that, and that will, that will introduce a new type to the system, and it will automatically for you, as you define an inductive type, create a, what's called a recursion principle, which uh, tells you what you need to do to define functions out of this type, and in the case of the natural numbers, it would be exactly the usual induction principle that that, uh, that we do that we do in mathematics all the time. But when you get used to type theory, you realize that everything is an inductive type, and there are, you have to get used to the idea that there are many many different induction principles for all these different types. So this inductive type here is meant to be the type of labeled trees, or the labels of some type beta. The idea is that the two ways you can make a labeled, or I guess I should have said labeled binary tree, maybe you can make a leaf which just takes a single label and produces a tree, or you can make something that looks like a branch that takes a label and a pair of trees and assembles them together in the, in the obvious way. Okay. And the, those three lines there are all that's necessary to introduce that new type, and it automatically creates a recursion principle and so on. Okay, 
And then you can write things that uh, um, maybe feel more like uh, both programming languages you might have seen in other places, but also feel like, like doing mathematics. Uh, but here we're just saying we're going to define the type pre-sheaf. And saying structure here uh, is really just saying that it's a very simple sort of inductive type with a single constructor. Or whatever. Uh, let's not worry about that exactly. Uh, the structure pre-sheaf just means that well, pre-sheaves are going to be parameterized by two things, C, some type, and the evidence that we can, we're allowed to think of those Cs as a category. And then a pre-sheaf parameterized by C and a category structure on C will consist of two things, X, a topological space, and O, a functor in the open sets of X into our category. And that's that's exactly how, uh, I mean, up to, up to syntax, that's what a mathematician would say to define a, a pre-sheaf. And we really can write exactly those three lines in Ling to, to define a, to define a pre-sheaf. Of course, we need to have said what we mean by all these things. And again, you can see this is a dependent type. Uh, it depends on a type C, and it also depends on a, a term here, the actual category structure that tells you how to do composition and so on. Uh, and things like that. Okay, uh, so Koch has essentially identical logical foundations. The, the way they handle universes is slightly different, but otherwise it's, it's the same version of dependent type theory. And the rules for these inductive constructions is called the, the calculus of inductive constructions, which from a, mathematician, from a user's point of view, you can completely ignore. Just like we ignore ZFC all the time as mathematicians. I don't think I've actually ever, ever seen the axioms of ZFC written down. I have no desire to. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I have been told that the logical foundations of Lean do have a model in ZFC plus some number of inaccessible cardinals. Don't quote me on what the number is. Um, and, and I think dependent type theory, although officially we don't use it, is actually very natural to mathematicians and we're used to thinking of all our mathematical objects as having types, and we don't get confused about the types of things, and we're used to the idea that types can depend on, 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 on data in exactly this way. My, my favorite example that I think that, uh, that, that convinces, well, that convinced me at least, that I already knew dependent type theory before anyone told me about it, is, in, is, is this sentence here. Three is a topology on two, okay? That's ridiculous. I mean, three is an actual number. It can't be a topology. Don't be stupid. Uh, but, of course, in ZFC, everything is a set. And so three is some set. And if you remember the way that people set things up in ZFC, the, the usual encoding of natural numbers in, in ZFC, where we, where we say zero means the empty set, and one means the set containing the empty set, and two means the set containing that set for one along with the empty set, and so on. Okay. You see that in ZFC, not only is this sentence well formed, that is, it sort of syntactically makes sense, it's actually true. <laughs> the, the, the encoding of three as a set is a topology on the set for two. Okay. <laughs> Ridiculous. I mean, ZFC is clearly junk. If, if, I mean, it's bad enough that that sentence is syntactically correct, worse than it's true. What's that? Okay, yeah. So here I mean like ZFC along with the usual way that people set up the, the, first, the first round of things. But yeah, clearly silly. Three is an actual number, it can't be a topology. Okay. Uh, and the one thing I want to emphasize, because I think mathematicians are often confused about this, when you're doing dependent type theory or interactive theorem proving generally, there's no commitment to using intuitionistic logic or using homotopy type theory or being constructive or anything like that. You can work in those worlds if you feel like it, but it's not at all compulsory. And indeed, the, the, the development of mathematics that's happened so far in the standard library of Lean is completely in classical logic, the way that we're all used to working. No worries about using the axiom of choice. Only a few obnoxious people will complain. Um, no, they're not obnoxious. Sorry. Sorry if you're listening there, Kenny. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it was just a joke to make these people laugh, okay? I, I really don't mind you being constructive, Kenny. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so how, how do we do interactive theorem proving if we want to? Um, okay, Lean can run 
in a browser. Uh, I think I've got this right here. Uh, the Lean Web Editor. Okay, there we go. Oh, that font is way too small, isn't it? Um, so there's us proving that for natural numbers, m and n, m plus n is equal to n plus m. I'm a bit lazy about it and just use the simplifier, which probably already knows that fact in, in there, so it's a bit of a cheat. But you can do little calculations if you want. Eval 3 plus 5, and oh, it's not going to take forever to catch up. Oh, it's being too slow. Okay, don't use the live web editor, I guess it's too slow. What did I do wrong? That's unconvincing. Okay, <laughs> um, you can uh, do, uh, you can run lean in CoCalc, which some of you might have seen if you've used Sage before. Um, you just make a new .lean file and it, uh, it hopefully works uh, very slowly. Uh, oh, this one worked. If eval 2 plus 2 did actually output output 4. So it does run. Um, CoCalc actually has all nice setup for like running courses and things like that. So you can even make your students use lean uh, without any setup hassle. Um, but really what we do is um, uh, use, use some, an editor that has a nice integration with lean that, that tells us what we're doing and, and gives us hints about what's going on. Uh, there's also a very nice uh, introductory book uh, called Theorem Proving in Lean, uh, which is actually written for mathematicians. There's a companion book, Programming in Lean, which isn't quite finished yet, but it's extremely helpful and, and uh, says all of the things I've said so far much more clearly and also shows you how to start using, uh, using Lean. So I thought at this point I would maybe uh, actually prove something so you can just see what it's like working in Lean. And this is way too ambitious with the time I have remaining, but let's do it anyway. Um, let's prove uh, that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So there are many ways we can do this, but one way that we might do it is say that for any natural number n, there exists a p uh, greater than n such that p is prime. Okay, Lean already complains, it says, uh, what's this prime you're talking about? So we need to make a little import. Uh, and to make life easy, we'll, we'll open a namespace too. And hopefully, it's not going to sit here forever before it starts. Oh, God. I checked this just before I started talking that it was going to run instantly. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So uh, if we bring up the, 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 the goal view here, it shows us where we're up to. It says we've got an actual number in, and, and there's our goal. OK? So let's quick, quickly think about, uh, and let's plug in power, which for some reason isn't working. There we go. Um, let's quickly think about the maths. How are we going to do this? There are lots of ways to do this, but a good trick maybe is we'll take the natural number n, we'll calculate n factorial plus 1, we'll take a prime factor of that, and we'll see that does the job. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. So let's let m be um, factorial n plus 1. You could probably set things up so that you could write an exclamation mark for factorial, but we haven't done that. Let's take a, a prime factor. And I happen to know that uh, there's a function called minfac, which extracts the minimum prime factor from some number. So let me just do that. And now I've got a bunch of extra hypotheses. I've got m and p. And now we're, we're, we're off to the races. Uh, let's say that that p satisfies the existential goal we have. Exists i is, is a tactic here. It's something that, uh, I guess it stands for instantiate existential. Uh, if you look before and after, if we look at the goal before and after we run that, uh, you'll just see that before we had to we claim there exists some p, and afterwards we only claim there exists a proof that p is bigger than n, and so on. Okay. So off we go. Um, let's, uh, we've got two things to prove. P is bigger than n and P is prime. Let's run split, which turns that into two separate goals. Uh, but maybe actually before we do that, I happen to know, because I thought about this a moment before, uh, 
the, in both of the goals, we're actually going to need to know the fact that P is prime. So maybe before we split, let's go deal with that. So before the split, let me write have PP colon prime P. That's, that's saying we, we have the fact that P is prime. And if we look at the goal, let's, let me just remove the split. Oops. If I look at the goals after I've done that, uh, it says, well, your first goal is to prove that assertion that P is prime. But now in the later goal, you've got the fact that P is prime. Okay. So how do, we, uh, how do we deal with that first goal? Uh, it's common to set up, put braces in here to say you're just working on one of the, two, one of the multiple goals. And let's see. Uh, I happen to know that there's a function called minfact prime. If I had a bit more time, I'd show you how to find these functions. But uh, this just asserts that the minimum prime factor of a number is actually prime. And so I can write apply. And look at that. It, we got rid of the goal that p was prime, but it noticed that there was a side condition for us. It noticed that that's not, it's only true that the minimum factor is prime if m is actually not 1. Okay, Because then the only sensible way to find the minimum factor is, is one itself. So, okay, notice that side condition, we better deal with it. It's boring though, so let's just say sorry for now. We don't want to deal with that. Uh, but uh, even if I go here and sorry out all of my goals, uh, what you'll notice is that the theorem here has a green squiggly underline which says you're not done yet. That theorem is not true yet. You used sorry along the way. But it's a, good, it's a good strategy to sort of put aside the boring bits of the proof that you know you can deal with and to concentrate on the hard bits first. Hey, let, let, okay, let's leave that one sorry, actually, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll come back to the main goal here, uh, which now we want to split. And so our job now is to prove that, uh, um, that P is greater than or equal to N. Well, if you think about the maths for a moment, the way you're meant to do this is by contradiction. And so we write by contradiction. And that then says, oh, okay, so now your goal is to prove false, and you've got the fact that it's not true that P is greater than equal to N. That's a ridiculous way to say it. So let's just write simp at A, and that hypothesis A changes to the more sensible P is less than N. Okay. So now... Uh, well, how do, you, how do you actually get a contradiction out of, out of these facts? I guess what you meant to do is assert, first of all, that uh, P uh, divides, let's see, what does it divide? It divides uh, fact N, just because P is smaller than N, so it's going to divide the factorial, but let's say sorry for now. And we've got uh, the fact that P divides oops, divides m. Why is that true? Well, we picked p as, the, as, a, as a factor of m. Okay, so that should be easy as well. So let's say sorry there. And then combining those two facts, we can prove that p divides, oops, divides 1. Okay, because m was just fact n plus 1. Okay, so it'll give us that p divides 1. That should be pretty easy as well. It's just using some facts about division. And... Uh, now we know that p divides 1 and p is prime, and that's, our, that's surely our contradiction. So this step should be pretty easy as well. So I've got to the point where uh, I think all the remaining steps probably ought to be easy. Uh, and if I had more time, I would go through and show you how to fill them all in. So none of them are worse than a, than a line or two. Uh, but let me also demonstrate that automation is your friend. And sometimes when things feel easy, the computer really can just fill things in for you. So let me import a tactic called backwards reasoning. The idea of backwards reasoning is very simple. It just looks at the goal, tries to identify if it's got any lemmas whose conclusion matches the goal, and then just works backwards. It tries to see if it can fill in the hypothesis of that lemma and sees if it can close everything off. And so I think here, I checked this beforehand. If I just take all my sorries, and replace them with backwards reasoning. And we wait a little while for the yellow bar to go away. The yellow bar on the right side is saying I'm still compiling. Ah, it disappears, and there are no red squiggles. And there's no green line saying you use, you use sorry. And that's Lean's way of saying, yes, I believe your theorem. You are infinite many times. Um, okay. Uh, 
in the copy of the notes that are, that are online already, it actually shows you how to fill in all of the details without, without appealing to backwards reasoning, actually proving the facts yourself. Um, but I think it's good to know that, that both options are available. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, I, I certainly didn't have to know how to do these little steps here. But yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is interactive theorem proving. The, the, the goal is, is not necessarily that the computer is just going to come along and do everything for you. Um, the, 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 the goal here is to, is to have a conversation with the computer, and we're going to have to tell it some things. Um, in fact, here you can um, you can get you can get this proof a fair way a fair bit shorter than this. I think you at some point have to tell this essential idea. Well, these two essential ideas: you want to use factorial n plus one, and you're going to use this divisibility trick. You can you can compress this probably if you really work on this, you can compress it down to basically those those four lines and maybe one or two extra lines of of, of clue. Um, okay, now. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I think that's, <laughs> that's... Ah, yeah, so, I mean, this is a good question, uh, basically about whether we want our proofs to be right for the computer to be readable by humans after the fact. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's genuine disagreement amongst the the world of interactive theorem proofers, how valuable that, is, that actually is. Um, I think there's actually a pretty good argument that uh, carefully stated and chosen lemmas should be readable by the, by the humans, and you maybe shouldn't worry once you go below the lemma level uh, about how readable things are. Um, there are certainly, most of the existing standard library of mathematics in Lean is written in that style. You're not really expected to want to redigest lemmas. Um, but there are some examples in some corners of it where these proofs are also beautifully commented and, and explain step by step what's going on. Um, you can also, and you can make this much more readable. Notice here after the split, I had two goals, and I just launched into proving one without really saying what I was doing. I could prefix this by saying show p is greater than n. It doesn't change the logic of the proof at all, but it says I'm about to show you that p is greater than or equal to n. And so there, is, there are a bunch of tricks like that that. Um, that, that, that make the proof substantially, substantially more readable. Uh, I was mostly going there for proving the theorem in the allotted 10 minutes of the talk rather than trying to make it readable. Um, but no, it's a, people disagree how readable we should try and make these proofs. Okay, uh, where are we? We only have a minute or two more here. Um, Okay, so what do you do next after you can prove some stuff? So uh, I've, I've mentioned this a little bit already. There's this standard library for Lean that people have been working on. It's pretty primitive compared to, um, well, all of mathematics. Uh, it's got a pretty substantial chunk of undergraduate mathematics in it. It's missing a pretty substantial chunk of undergraduate mathematics. Uh, it's Got a bunch of graduate mathematics in it as well. I mean, some examples are uh, holomorphic functions, Noetherian rings, and the Aneta lemma all landed in the standard library in the last month. And Lin can now use all those facts. Uh, I mean, I'll also admit that the definition of pi also only landed in the last month. So like, you can see that uh, we're up to different points in different directions. Um, the, there's been a, a push amongst a few sort of algebraic geometers and, and number theorists who've been playing with me to try and do some really modern mathematics just to verify that it's possible in these systems to talk about sort of mathematics with, with great conceptual depth, long, long stacks of definitions and, and complicated dependency structures. And I think the report from them is, is really positive. So perfectoid spaces are these gadgets that, um, that Schultz had just got a Fields Medal for. Uh, well, we've proved some theorems about them, but the definition is important as well. And it's pretty close to fully explained, to fully explained in Lean now, at least the definition of perfectoid spaces. And so I think that's sort of a, an interesting sign uh, that, that there's maybe no, no obstacle to doing arbitrarily advanced 
mathematics we can no given, given enough time and effort uh, it's not impossible okay um, and I, I think maybe I mentioned this earlier but there are, there are a bunch of, of students at ANU at Imperial who are working in Lean and Kevin Buzzard is, is, is very uh, optimistically maybe uh, starting a, a first year course this semester taught, a, taught in, at, at Imperial where he's giving them the homework sets in Lean uh, we'll see what happens um, the, he, he's giving, I mean, he's setting things up to make it easy for them, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, maybe I don't want to talk about this so, so much. Here's a nice paper where someone uh, found a, a mistake in, in, uh, in sort of uh, hyperbolic geometry papers and, and reformalized the, the fix. There's a very interesting project that Thomas Hales is starting next year where he's paying a whole lot of people. He's got a giant, giant grant, uh, and he's going to start formalizing just the abstracts of significant papers. He's not going to actually attempt to necessarily reconnect it back to ground level. He'll use lots of sorries in places, but he'll at least give, uh, give formal statements of important papers. Uh, again, I'm not too sure where that's going to go. Um, okay, so the, the, the thing that I, I address, well, I mentioned right at the beginning, is this idea that, that Lean is its own meta-language, makes it possible for, for mere mortals to write new tactics. And essentially, the point is just that you write new tactics in Lean. Within Lean, there's a special keyword, meta, that should have really been called unsafe or something, which lets you do dangerous things. So, so you can't use the output of, of a meta function in a proof, but a meta function can write a proof. And that's an important distinction. And it's relatively easy, once you've learned Lean, to also write, write new tactics, because you're doing it all in the same language. And this was completely untrue in all of the previous uh, setups. And I think this is why it's maybe worth starting to advertise this to mathematicians, because they're also now able to, to write some tactics. Uh, the, I had two things to show you at the end. I'm not sure which one to show you. Um, my effort in developing things in Lean so far has been trying to write mathematics in Lean, refusing to write things that a human would leave out. That is, I go away and write the automation first that, that gets things down to a bare minimum. And so here I've got three examples drawn from other theorem proofs of people proving the unnatal lemma in the uh, This is about half of, half of it in, in goody math. This is about a quarter of it in cough. And this is about a 20th of it, 20th of it in, in Isabel. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, uh, here on a page, is everything about the unato func un functor and the fact that it's an embedding and the unato lemma, uh, all in a couple of lines. I'm not going to have time to go through it, but what I will say is that there is absolutely nothing written on this page that is not the bare minimum you have to say. This, the definitions here just say what the unato functor does on objects. It just says what this projection does. It never proves that anything is natural or functorial, or that two functions are ever inverses of each other. The automation goes away in the background and does all of that for you. It really is as minimal as you can possibly get. And you can see that that's the definition for people who know the unit of functor. You can see that, that uh, you really say as, as little as, as a human would say, even on a, on a first day, um, to, to define that. And that's all possible because of, of writing, nice, um, writing nice tactics. And since I've got one minute, let me not explain this, but just show you something, hopefully this will pop up in just a second, here we go. So this is a lovely little piece of automation that one of my students at ANU wrote. The idea here is we want to prove that A equals B, and we've got a whole bunch of lemmas, and all that we're going to do is start rewriting sub-expressions of A, trying to make A look more and more like B, okay, and hopefully we get there. Now, the example that it's working on, sorry, it's running slow because my computer's crappy, I don't know, it should be faster than this, but... What can you do? It's a talk. Everything goes wrong. Um, the the graph, the, the complete graph of possible rewrites here is huge. Every vertex you see here has valence 15 or something, and it, and it goes on forever. If you run this long enough, you fill the screen with, with vertices. Uh, but what we'll see in about 30 seconds at this rate um, is that this, this trick is going to find us a very narrow path uh, from, the, from, from A to B by the, the whole sequence of successive rewrites. And it's using a pretty human heuristic along the way. 
a very dumb human heuristic, but that's okay. Um, I think it's important when doing interactive theorem proving to admit that humans are sometimes not as smart as they like to think they are. Um, all that it's doing is using the edit distance. It's got two expressions it's trying to prove are equal, and it just writes them out as strings on a piece of paper and calculates how many characters it has to change to turn one into the other. And then it just blindly applies lemmas, rewriting sub-expressions, trying to make the left-hand side look more like the right-hand side. I do it all the time. And it works here. Uh, I mean, it finds some path at length 13 or something. But this graph is really fully explored it. Every one of these vertices here has another dozen neighbors, and all of those have neighbors and so on. Uh, and the reason, what it's doing here, and it's proving something in category theory. What's it proving? We have an equivalence. Uh, if a functor is an equivalence of categories, then it's full. And the lovely trick is that we really just say the bare minimum things that a human would say. Or like, here's how you construct a pre-image, and to prove that it really is a pre-image, you use objectivity. And then the automation takes over and does it. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I'll just end with that point since I'm over time. The, the, sorry, uh, this picture. Um, you mean from a technical point of view, how did we make the picture? <laughs> like what? So, all, I mean, the, the, well, tell me if I'm answering the wrong question. I mean, this window here is just like high graph, some library in Python that visualizes graphs and does like string forces to move the vertices around. Um, lean, as it is traversing this graph of possible rewrites of the expressions, trying to prove that A equals B is just spitting out, it's just reporting to this external program via a pipe. Here's what I found so far. Uh, I mean, the, I'm not sure. Okay. The, I mean, the, the program that is traversing this graph is doing interesting things. It's doing edit distance. It's trying to minimize the edit distance between the two sides of the equation it's trying to prove. But it's also doing, well, I think in this version. Okay, no, no, this is the, this is the dumb version before. My fantastic students can only make it better. It, he's now got a version that uses some basic machine learning. It's trying to prove A equals B. And it works for a while trying to prove it. And it notices that the symbol F appears a lot on the left. And, it never, and the symbol G appears a lot on the right. They never appear on the other sides. And it starts to learn from that that a lemma that changes F's into G's is important. And it tries to apply that lemma. And I wasn't demonstrating that here. But this technique both works and is writable by undergraduates in, in lane. So you can, you can start to import some pretty fancy ideas about how to go about proving things and implement them. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found usually is that there are often a lot of functions that are proven from text data and some other language, like Java or Haskell, like the Rama program. Yeah, yeah, yep. Do they think of this thing? So, um, yes and no. So um, the, the basic answer is that we all expect that the current broken, semi-broken output to executable code will be fixed and beautiful and really efficient in about six months' time. The, that's certainly the, the, the plan. The current implementation is not ideal. But the, the next version of Lean coming out soon, uh, in fact, is going to compile all of your tactics, the, the, the meta code you write, into LLVM bytecode on like on the fly as it's running lean and the promise is that everything's going to be super fast and you'll get executable code for many of the constructed problems. Yeah, well, okay. I've got a question about your talk about the things that we're going to talk about now that aren't in the Yeah. Um, I think the fair answer is actually no. I think the answer is that everyone agrees that we're not there yet and we need to work out in what ways the current solutions are broken by, by hammering on them a whole lot and mm -hmm. going as far as we can. I mean, we know that we, I think the better answer is we know that the best solution in a couple of years' time is we're going to throw out everything we've done and start again in the new language. <laughs> uh, the, the problem of trend, taking code from one theorem, written in one yeah, theorem yeah. proven, taking it to the next one, 
is genuinely hard. Yeah. And this is a problem and a, and a worry and a reason for mathematicians not to get involved yet. Because... It's, a, it's genuinely a big problem. And I, I think that... Um, and I think there's not a good answer to that. <laughs> Oh, wow, fantastic. Okay. Yes. <laughs>